the next method is a really powerful one and is, I think, an underutilized one, and it's called uh, symmetry breaking. So imagine we have a situation where uh, you have decision to make between two competing possible uh, solutions, and if you look at the objective function, the decision that you make actually has no impact on the objective function value. So think of this example I've shown over here, we'll get, we'll get to that, but ultimately you have these choices that the solver is forced to make, but it has no reason to prefer one or the other on the face of it. So let's look at the example. So here we have a, uh, a really, again, a trivial example, very simplistic example, but I think it illustrates the point. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to maximize an, an objective function where z, our objective function value, is the summation of the binary variable with two indices, i and j, of y, i comma j. So y is one if uh, the ball here, the sphere ball number i is placed in bin number j. So we're just trying to get as many of, the, of these balls into the bins as we can. Um, there's four maximum per bin, and we have 15 uh, balls that we have to fit in there. So as you can see from looking at this, there's uh, actually a lot of possible solutions, right? There's, you can easily fit 15 into four bins by just placing uh, four in three bins and then three in one, one of the remaining bins. So it doesn't actually matter the order that they go in. It doesn't matter which bin has any, uh, or which bin has the most uh, balls or has the, the three number of balls in it. Uh, the, the objective function only cares that you somehow place these in. So the, the solver is actually going to need to go through and determine the state y, i, comma, j for every possible combination of a ball in a bin. Um, so you can imagine it, it's going to have to go through this, through this tree, make an assessment, and when it's deciding whether or not to move to the next uh, branch in the tree, it's going to compare the objective function value. Well, here there's a lot of different objective function value uh, values that are exactly equivalent. So in this problem, we only care that we get some feasible solution. We don't actually care what the order is. There's no preference given. And so we somehow need to give the problem a little bit more information about, um, say, all things equal, what is our preferred uh, grouping of balls and bins? What is the uh, bin that we would prefer to have empty if possible? So uh, let's look at how we'd actually formulate the problem to accomplish that. So here's the actual formulation, right? Here's our objective function. We have these two constraints where we're saying um, the summation of all, for all, over all bins of the binary yij is less than or equal to one. So what this is saying is that every ball can only be in one bin, right? One ball can only be in one bin. Uh, and that's true for every single ball in the set of all i balls. Uh, the second constraint is that we're requiring that there's no more than four balls in each bin. So we're going to sum for every uh, ball, we're going to sum which of those are in bin j. And then for every single bin, we're going to make sure that they're less than less than or equal to four. Right, so these two constraints uh, implement the requirements that we have. But again, there's no preference in this given to, to which balls goes in, go, go in which bins. So there's actually a couple aspects of symmetry here that we need to worry about, but the first symmetry is that there's no preference for the bin. Right? The, all, all bins are kind of created equal. So let's start by introducing a cost parameter, which we'll, which we'll call C sub J, and it is the cost of placing a ball in a bin. Uh, and then we're again, we're trying to maximize the objective function value here. So if you were to place a ball in bin four, let's say you would get a dollar and four cents for doing that. If you place it in bin three, you get a dollar and three cents and so on. So there's a kind of a small but uh, different valued parameter that goes with each bin. Now, when it comes time for the solver to decide, you know, first of all, which bins do I prefer? It's going to always prefer to fill up the bins in order of greatest to smallest, and it will really reduce the number of, tr of uh, nodes on the tree that have to be explored. 
the second aspect of symmetry is looking at the uh, difference between the balls themselves. So we maintain that uh, for a given bin, there's a, a differential benefit of placing a ball, but we can also do the same kind of symmetry breaking on the balls themselves. So instead of having a single parameter C sub J, let's now create a, a two indexed parameter C I J. And that corresponds to the product of the ball value and the bin value. So you take 1.001 times 1.04, and uh, sorry, 1.01, and that would be C11. And you just sort of continue through this whole process. You have this uh, matrix of costs, and then the solver's job is going to be really easy because it's always going to want to place the most valuable ball and the most valuable bin to get the most money out of uh, or the most revenue out of this problem. So you're going to start by placing ball 15 in bin 4, 14 in 4, and so on, until you fill everything up and your uh, objective function is maximized. So again, this is a way that we can break the symmetry of the problem, and that is we're breaking, uh, we're providing some information where the solver can compare and fathom branches. Uh, and ultimately, it doesn't actually change the solution that we get, like it doesn't change the result, and the result is that we just need to fit, find a feasible way of fitting these balls into the bins, but it does make the solver's life a lot easier. In a real example or a practice, uh, example in practice, think about scheduling the production of a power plant. Uh, let's say that you have some price schedule and in hours, you know, one through 12 of the day, there's a variable price structure and in hours uh, 13 through 24, the price structure becomes flat. So you don't actually care once you get to that flat structure what the, uh, what, what the production is because it doesn't really matter. You're just, you produce energy at any moment in time and you're gonna get the same revenue. So rather than leave that very flat price structure intact, we could introduce very small differences between each of the objective function uh, cost multipliers, that is the, the price that you're getting for selling electricity at any moment in time, a very small differential that's maybe less than the, the differential of a real that you'd really see from time step to time step, but you know, uh, on, on the order that's significant where uh, you can actually have the solver decide between time steps, giving you back an objective function value that ultimately is not really significantly different from what you get with a purely symmetric model but you're able to determine much more quickly what, what the optimal solution is.